Thank you, brother. Let us remain standing just a moment for prayer. Precious Lord, we thank Thee that we have this privilege tonight to come into Thy presence and call Thee our Father. And we ask that You will regard us tonight as Thy children who have been saved by the grace of Thy Son, the Lord Jesus. And we pray that You will pour out to us tonight that which our hearts call for, mercy from God, for salvation of lost souls, and for restoration of the gifts to the church, and for divine healing for the sick and the afflicted, and for joy for those who are sorrowing, and for mercy for those who are desiring so. And we'll praise Thee. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> it's a very stormy weather we're having, and still the prediction is more snow and cold weather. And I am very grateful tonight for you people who have come out regardless of the weather. May the Lord give to you the desire of your heart. I've been staying just a little late because of the just a few people like this to talk to, kind of getting this situation laid out clearly so that if the weather does clear and the people comes in for a nice crowd, that you might be my helper in bringing the gospel message to the others. Then in the coming week, the Lord willing, we wish to take some very stern texts to preach the gospel and also that you might tell the people, be instructed to know how to tell them to receive their healing and how to wait and to watch for the Lord as you meditate upon Him, that it takes meditation on the Lord to bring Him in your presence. That is right, always. It's while we think on these things that Christ appears. I would like to read for a scripture tonight, and I love the scripture reading. God's eternal word. We can just base our faith upon that blessed, eternal, immortal word and know that it is sure. I wish to take from St. Matthew's Gospel, the 17th chapter, and the first few verses to read. Now, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. But while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And if it should be called a text, I would like to take those last three words in the fifth verse. Hear ye him. You might say, Brother Branham, that is rather a small text. But remember, it is the written word of the eternal God. And every word is perfect. There has been man down through the age that has 
preach from this same text since it was written. And every time we read it, we get something new from it. Any of us who read the Bible know that it is such a, a book. There's nothing like it ever written or ever will be. It is the greatest word of all words. Even the visions are secondary. If the vision is contrary to what the word says, then the vision's wrong. God's word is right all the time. And may I stop here just a moment to say this, and I'll go on record because the recorders are going, that any divine promise in God's Word, if you take the right mental attitude towards any of God's divine promises, will bring it to pass, regardless of what it is. If God promised it, and you show the right mental attitude, God will fulfill his promise to you. That promise is good to anyone who will look at it in that respect. If I'd write you a letter, you might appreciate that, because in it it would be something that's showing our friendship. But then your neighbor might read that letter, and they wouldn't get nothing out of it because it's not to them. But that's not right in the reading of the Word of God. It's to all of us, whosoever will. My letter would run out when you finish your life. But man down through the ages has read God's eternal Word, and it's inspired them all through every age. Just as true, just as thrilling tonight as it was the very hour that the scribe Matthew wrote it. And then you can see why, no matter how little the scripture is, how small, it's the context that's in it. It's something that's inspired. Here not long ago, a little friend in the city of Louisville, he was playing around up in the attic, or garret as you might want to call it, and he ran into some old rubbish that would have been laying back, and he found a little postage stamp, just about one inch square. And as he looked at this little stamp, the little fellow with ice cream in his mind, he thinks, I've got a stamp collector friend down the street, I'll go sell him that stamp because it's an old one. He took the stamp thinking he would get a nickel, and down the street he went to his friend to sell the stamp. And when he arrived, he said to his stamp collecting friend, what will you give me for this stamp? The collector, well posted, looked at it, and he said, I'll give you a dollar for that stamp. Oh, the ice cream then went into many cones. Certainly he sold it quickly for the purchase of one dollar. The stamp collector sold it two weeks later for five hundred dollars. And now the stamp, the last I heard of it, is worth almost three quarters of a million dollars. What a little stamp, just one inch square. It isn't the paper that meant anything. It's what's wrote on the stamp that means so much. And the little three-word text. It isn't the size of it, neither is it the, the paper that it's written on. It's what it is. It's the Word of the living God. 
That's what makes it so real. Hear ye him. God, always in his great feeling towards people, he meets in the counsel of man. God only works through his church. The church is God's agency. He said one place in the gospel, I am the vine, ye are the branches. The vine does not bear fruit. It purges the branch and the branch bears fruit. So the church is the branch that the Holy Spirit is working through. He speaks through the pastor's lips. He works through his hands. And through divine gifts, he sets his body into emotions, led by the Holy Spirit by emptying himself out and letting the Holy Spirit take control. He brings messages. He sees visions. And great things, no matter what it might be, that God has chosen him to do, if he'll yield to the Spirit, God will work through him or any member of his church. So we find out that God doesn't altogether meet in large councils of man. One time he met with 500. He met once with 70. Then with three. And even to one. Jesus said that wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. That's one of the outstanding things that makes him God to me. I've had the privilege in my ministry to meet great men, kings, monarchs, potentates, great men. And I would be trembling when I met them for fear that, that I might say the wrong thing. But I find out when I come to men which really are big men, they are the humblest and the meekest. They make you feel that you're a great big somebody. But it's that fellow who thinks he's a big man that you can't get along with. Oh, he's just so big you can't touch him. That's the way it goes. But God, the King of heaven, so condescending that he'll come to the lowest prostitute in this city on this cold night. She would only ask. To the beggar on the street, anywhere that there is a need and a sincerity towards him, God will come. In this case, he had three men, Peter, James, and John. And he was just about to reveal something that he was going to do. God always, before he does anything, he always sends a forewarning of it. And may I say here, that's the reason that we're here tonight. And that's the reason that great efforts for revival is made the world over. God's getting ready to do something. And always before judgment, he sends mercy. And if you spurn mercy, nothing's left but judgment. For you have judged it the way you have regarded the message. You refuse the message, nothing left but judgment. But God always shows beforehand what he's going to do. And we see him take three witnesses, Peter, James, and John, and go up into a high mountain. And there was transfigured before them. Now three is the confirmation. 
Did you notice when he raised up Jairus' daughter, he had Peter, James, and John, and put the rest out of the house? A witness is three. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And this is just a little thing on the side, but it always appeared to me that Peter represented faith, James, hope, and John, charity. Hope, faith, and charity. God earthly witness. And that is also wrapped in every ministry that comes from God. Faith, hope, and charity. Faith to perform his word. Hope for the people and love for all. Then not only that, but this event was so great that there's always something that goes on in heaven at the same time. There was three earthly beings, Peter, James, John. And from heaven come Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And God the Father was looking upon the sea. Three heavenly witnesses, three earthly witnesses. God was going to do something. And it had to be witnessed in heaven. And it had to be witnessed on earth. What he was going to do. Oh, that must have been a great hour for those apostles. Peter later on called it the holy mountain. Now, it wasn't a holy mountain in so much that the mountain was holy. It was the holy God on the mountain. It isn't the holy church. It's the Holy Spirit in the church. It isn't a holy man. It's the Holy Ghost in the man. Peter said the holy mount where the holy God descended. And they heard his voice. Notice now, I know in the presence tonight is many clergymen, and I realize, my brethren, that most time ministers taking this text refer to it to the second coming of Jesus, the order, and that is true. But the entire Bible is so inspired to every Phase of the Bible dovetails together. You could take this text and preach anything from it because it's a part of God's Word. Anything that goes in the Bible will hook with this. And tonight I want to take it from a little different standpoint. In the Old Testament we read, of the placing or the adoption of a child. When a child was born into a family, that didn't make him yet an heir of all things. And I think that's where most people today make their mistakes. I think that's where the Pentecostal people made a mistake, if you'll pardon the, the rude thing. That's where the Methodists made a mistake. The Lutherans. It's where we've all made a mistake. The Lutherans said the just shall live by faith. And if you just believe it, you've got it. No, that's different. Paul in Acts 19 said to those people, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you have believed? So that lets that out. The Methodist said, you've got it when you shout. That is, your early Methodist. When you shout, you got it. And they found out many shouted who didn't have it. And the Pentecost come along, of the restoration of the gifts, 
And they said, when you speak with tongues, you've got it. But they found out many spoke with tongues who didn't have it. Those things are all right. But you can never major on a minor. That's an attribute of the Holy Spirit. Right. Any of those emotions, which I believe in every one of them, but that's not it yet. The Holy Spirit, when you receive it, is the person of the Lord Jesus dwelling in you. And Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. The fruit that at the branch bears tells what vine it's in. Now, in the Old Testament, when a child was born in a family, he was a child when he was born. Now, we take that literally, which is truth. When a child is born, he's a son. And when you're born again of the Spirit of God, you become a son of God. But don't stop there. You just begin. Now, to get a little background of this picture, let's go back in the Old Testament. And you notice in the King James, it says this, in my father's house is many mentioned. That sounds strange. I think one translator made it more ridiculous than that. In my father's apartment house is many apartments. But doesn't it sound strange that in my father's house is many mansions? A mansion setting many mansions, millions of them, setting in a house. Well, in the days of the early translators, translating for King James, they translate according to their words of that day. A king was considered a father. His domain was his house. And that's very scriptural. The right translation is this. In my father's kingdom is many palaces. That's the right translation. Notice. But in my father's house, in his domain, is many palaces. Now, in the Old Testament, when a child was born in a home, he was a son when he was born. Galatians teaches this, Paul, in the book to the Galatians. He was a son when he was born. But yet that father, having much business, many servants on the farm, and he wanted his child to be educated, and they didn't have public schools as we have today. So he hired a tutor or a teacher to raise up this child, to give him his education, and to report to the father how this child progressed. Now you could imagine what type of a person that the father would get to raise his child. And it is a very beautiful type of God in his church. After the church is born again and becoming the family of God, God sent us a teacher. And he selected the best teacher that there was. He is the Holy Spirit. God never intended to have all kinds of cardinals and bishops over us. They are good men and have an office. But the Holy Spirit is God's teacher. He is sent to teach. And if the bishop or the teacher in the church is inspired by the Holy Spirit, then he's God's sent teacher. If he denies that, he's got a form of God in this but denying the power thereof. And in Timothy 3, it is written that it would be that way in this last day. But then the father, he never hired a teacher that would be wishy-washy. One who would want to put a, as we would call it today, a feather in his hat. Say, oh, your child is doing fine when he's not. 
The father seen to it that he got a teacher that would be honest. And when the father of our spirit got a teacher for his church and for his children, he got an honest teacher, the Holy Spirit, who would bear record in the presence of God how his children was progressing. Now, what if this child was disobedient? How that teacher must have blushed when he come in the presence of the Father and would say to him, Sir, your boy is very disobedient. Oh, he won't learn. He won't listen. I just can't do nothing with him. How the father must feel in his heart of that child. And what do you think that the Holy Spirit feels when he comes before God the Father and say his church is all broke up, his children are separated by denominational barriers? How did they go to picture shows and stay home from church on Wednesday night to watch television? How did they smoke, they drink, they tell dirty jokes and act like the rest of the world? That's the very message that the Holy Spirit has to bring to the Father. Because that's the condition of the church today. Now, do not be critical and do not think that I'm trying to scold you. I'm only trying to tell you the truth. Look at the condition of the church today. The word will be read that Jesus' last commission, go into the world, these signs shall follow them that believe. And the church bypasses that. The healing of the body, the gifts of the Spirit, a pure and holy life. I don't mean to be rude now. Your pastors are here to preach this gospel. But if they don't do it, I want you to hear it this time of this part. It's a wrong thing for a woman to cut her hair. The Bible said so. And she disgraces her husband when she does it. And the church used to not do that, but today, because the pulpit is weak, they do it. And women wear these little bitty clothes that looks like a man's clothes. Slacks or something they call them. Did you know the Bible said that's a filthy and an abomination in God's sight? What's the Holy Spirit think when he brings that before God the Father? The way the daughters of the church is doing. And women in the summertime get out with little bitty short clothes on that they oughtn't to even appear before their husband in and mow the yards and walk up and down the streets with those little clothes on. And mean to tell me the Holy Spirit is in there? By their fruit you shall know them. You think I'm burning the women up? I want to tell you men something. Any man that will let his wife do that and smoke cigarettes, it shows what the man's made out of. That's right. And you're a servant of God. You're the boss of the house. Oh, I don't mean to be scolding, but brother, each of you, I'm to stand shoulder to shoulder in the presence of Christ someday. That's what the Bible teaches. And if I fail to tell you, then I'd rather have you a little angry with me now than to point your finger in my face at that day and say, if you'd have told me, I would have corrected it. But it'd be too late then. I know I'd better get away from that. But that's the thing that the Holy Spirit has to bring to the Father. And in the great church, beautiful, 
all the way from the littlest church all to the highest church, you find this. The days of miracles is past. There's no such a thing as these prophetic gifts anymore in the church. That was for the apostles. Why do you think the Holy Spirit has to say in the presence of the Father when the Holy Spirit said, Jesus said, if any man shall take anything out of this or add anything to it, I'll take his part out of the book of life. What does the Holy Spirit think when he has to bring such message as that before the Father? Of his children. Oh, certainly you cannot inherit anything that way. And when a meeting comes and the Spirit of God begins to work, we know that there's faults. I know there's middle illusions. I know there's all kinds of illusions. Because the Bible said there would be. But where the church is laid out, it ought to have the church taught and set up in such a way that it would know the right from wrong. See where we're at? Then the Holy Spirit has to bring that type of a message to the Father. Oh my! What must he say? Uh, certainly, if that boy and any teacher knows in the Bible that if that boy wasn't an obedient child, yet he was a son, he never inherited anything. Any Bible reader knows that. Read Ephesians, first chapter, the fifth verse. God predestinated us unto the children of God by the adoption of Jesus Christ. Adopting and placing a son. But now let's change the picture. And perhaps what if this child is an obedient child? Oh, they just are at, at the father's business. Does just the same thing the father does. Does the thing that's pleasing as Jesus said he did. Then what does the tutor say or the teacher in the presence of the father? Oh, how he must swell his chest out, the teacher, and walk up in the presence of the father and say, Oh, sir. Your boy is, excuse the expressions, I hope you won't think I'm sacrilegious, but he'd say he's just a chip off the old block. He's just exactly like him. He believes just the same thing that you wrote. He teaches everything just as you wrote it. He believes that you're the great I am, and he knows that he's an offspring of yours. And therefore he stands for you gallantly. How the father must say, that's my boy. What a wonderful thing that would be. That's what God wants us to be. The obedient. Then what happened in that case? If that child was disobedient, that yet he was a son. I'm not saying that you won't be saved. If you're born again, you've got salvation, you've got eternal life. You'll go to heaven. But what you're missing here, if you're disobedient, God might have to take you early. Many things might happen. You'll always be a crippled church. Division. I belong to this. I belong to that. I'd like for the whole church to say, I belong to Christ. Certainly, your denominations are all right if you just don't draw a fence. The pastor's for all the sheep, all denominations. It's God's church, Christ's body. Now, if this child was obedient, there was a ceremony to be made when the child become matured. They take him out in a public place. Listen close. Don't miss this. Watch the scripture. They taken the child out into a public place, placed the robe upon him, a royal robe, and they had a ceremony. And it was the ceremony of adoption. The child that had been born into the family become placed by adoption in the family. And after that, 
that boy's name was just as good on a check as his daddy's was. He was heir of all things. He could take out. He could put up. He could fire. He could hire. He could do whatever he pleased to do. Because the ceremony of adoption had been made upon his son, and he was clothed and was set in order. Now there's where the church ought to be today. Jesus said, These things that I do shall you do also. Ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Why are we scared of that? What's the matter if Christ has clothed us with the Holy Spirit and been adopted into the family after being born again and then baptized into the body by the Holy Spirit? If it's a true witness of God, ask what you will and it'll be done for you. Then we sit like, say, oh, well, that was something else. Have you received the false spirit? Do you act yet with the things of the world as we spoke of this afternoon? Do you still love them? Are they in your heart? Have you not been a separated person? Then maybe you haven't been adopted. But once adopted positionally placed in the body of Christ, you are heir of all things. Notice, that's what God did to his son. God didn't ask us to do anything that he would not do. He took his own son who had been obedient. This is just a little before the crucifixion. Remember what he said, come down, the Son of Man goes to Jerusalem, be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. He said, don't tell the vision to anyone. But while they were standing there, God adopted his own son. For he overshadowed him, and the Bible said that he put a robe on him insomuch that his raiment shined like the sun in his strength. Set him up before heavenly witnesses, before earthly witnesses, and a voice said, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. Whatever he says is just as good as my word. He was adopted. Jesus said, All powers in heaven and earth is given unto my hands. There's the adoption of God adopting his son. All the powers. Watch what Jesus said. If ye abide in me, my words abide in you, ask anything that you will, and it will be done unto you. But what's happened? Oh, the church has went off on some man-made theology and bypassed that. Now the evidence is the old southern expression used to be, the proof of the pudding is the eating thereof. Now, man under supernatural usually becomes emotional. And they want to start something different. Let a move of God get started. And watch man get all excited and try to impersonate something. Listen close. It's been in every generation. When the supernatural was done in Egypt, a mixed multitude went out. And there was a man by the name of Korah. He said, isn't there more prophets and isn't there more holy man than Moses? Let us have prophets and so forth and holy man. God said to Moses, separate yourself from him because the earth is going to open up and swallow him in. And did not he say in the last days that there would rise the same thing and they would perish in the gainsaying of Korah? Exactly. Now watch. Peter, all excited because the supernatural was being done, he said, let us build three tabernacles, if thou wilt, one for Moses, one for Elias, one for Jesus. Now he said this, oh, this is going to be a great move. Let's build a tabernacle here for everybody that wants to worship with Moses. Moses represented the law. And there is no salvation in the law. 
There's no legal thing that you can do that will merit your salvation. It's a free gift of God. Moses represented the law. And Peter wanted to build a tabernacle for all those who wanted to keep the Sabbath days and the new moons and everything. The law. But the law has no grace. The law is a policeman. The law only showed you your sin. The law only told you you were a condemned sinner. But it had no remedy for you. It can put you in jail, but it can't take you out. Who wants that? Not me. I don't want the law. It only tells me I'm a sinner and points to me the accusing finger that I have sinned and death is a penalty of sin. Moses, with his law, and Peter wanted people to have that kind of a church. Then the next he wanted to build a tabernacle unto Elisha. And Elijah represented the sternness of God or the justice of God. You remember him up on the mountain? God set him up there. And the king said, go up and get him with 50 men. And Elijah raised up, and it's so much to say this, I am the anointed servant of God. Don't come near me. And if you do, something will happen. Oh, he said, we got ours from the king, you fanatic. We'll get you anyhow. And they started. And Elijah said, if I be a man of God, let fire fall from heaven and consume you. And fire fell and consumed them. Justice what they deserve. I don't want that. So the king said, oh, perhaps there's a storm going over. Just some natural element happened because then days are gone. Let's send another 50. So another 50 come and Elijah said, if I be a man of God, let fire fall from heaven and consume you. And a fire fell and consumed them. He kind of got weary of sending 50. God still lives. In every generation, he's still God. But that's justice. I don't want the law. It puts in prison. I don't want justice. Listen, friend. I don't want justice. I want mercy, not justice. I was born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. I know it. And justice sends me to hell, God's own holy law. Justice sends me to hell for being a sinner. I don't want the law to point it to me. I don't want justice. I want mercy. But Peter wanted all that to go on, tabernacles to be built, denominational barriers and so forth. Oh, I'm a Moses. I'm a Elijah. So I want you to listen now just a minute. Before it even got from his mouth, blessed be the name of the Lord. There was a voice came from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. What did he represent? Mercy, salvation, justification, divine healing. He represented heaven's great joys for us. For the law and justice condemned us to hell. Christ, being innocent, suffering for the guilty, justified us freely by his grace and set us free from every penalty of sin. And met the requirement of the almighty God's justice. Jesus standing there. God said, this is my beloved son, let your denominations go. Let your little quacky ideas be gone. For this is my beloved son, hear ye him. I say to you tonight, oh, if I had the vocabulary, if I was only a, a preacher that had an education, if I only had some ability, 
but being a poor, ignorant southerner, I, if I had the ability, I would like this put that so close to every man and woman that they could see it. But I do know what I'm speaking of. I might not know the book too well, but I know the author real well. And to know him is life. I am not a fanatic. But I have a message for you. That that same Jesus that was screamed from the heavens by the Father, this is my beloved Son. He is not dead. He's alive in here tonight. And all of his power and his glory to manifest himself just like he did in the other age. For it's written in his infallible word, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's written in his word, the works that I do shall you also. As he manifested himself to the Jews, how did he do it? He manifested himself by one time when Philip went and found Nathaniel under a tree and brought him back. He said, come see who he found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. On his road back, Philip began to tell him. First Nathaniel said, could there be any good thing come out of a crowd of people like that at Nazareth? And Philip gave him a good answer, come and see. On the road over, no doubt he was telling him about how he knew Peter's name and who his father was. Now, I can imagine this staunch Orthodox Jew saying, now, wait a minute. I just can't believe that, Philip. Come along, be humble, come to the meeting, sit quiet, watch a few minutes. And when they got to the where the prayer line was, or whatever, Jesus is praying for the sick, many great educated priests and Pharisees all stood around in their cults. And when Philip walked up with Nathaniel, Jesus turned and looked at Nathaniel and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no God. It astonished him. He said, Rabbi, when did you know me? You never seen me in your life. How did you know me? Jesus said, Before Philip called you, when you were under that tree, I saw you. Thirty miles around the mountain. What eyes? And what did he say? He spoke for ever believing Jew. When he seen that done, he said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. That's what every true believer believes. And when he said that, he said, Because I told you these things you believe, you shall see greater than this, because he was a believer. God was manifesting himself before the ending of the Jewish dispensation. Then what happened to the Pharisees, the great doctors standing around? They said, that is a devil. He's a fortune teller. He's Beelzebub. They said it in their heart. They didn't say it out loud. But Jesus perceived their thoughts. And he said, you say that against me, it'll be forgiven. But if you speak one word against the Holy Ghost when it comes to do it, it will never be forgiven you. And this world are the ones that come. What? When the Holy Spirit makes its manifestation to the Gentile race, one word against it will never be forgiven. Then he introduced himself to the Samaritan group, a woman at the well. He said, bring me a drink. She said, oh, there's segregation. White and colored as it is in the South. And he let her know that there was no difference. All creatures of God. And he only found where her trouble was. He said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any husband. He said, that's right, you got five. Watch what the woman said, a Samaritan, not a Jew. He's only a Jew, Samaritan, and Gentile. But Jesus forbid his disciples to go to the Gentiles. He represented himself to the Jewish nation. Some turned him down, some believed him. Look how he did it. Then to the woman he said, she said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. 
We know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. He said, I'm he that speaks to you. And she ran into the city. Watch her make quotation. And she said, come see a man that told me the things that I've done. Isn't that the Messiah? Isn't that the sign of the Messiah? Sure. Then he'd done that to the Jewish to represent himself. He'd done it to the Samaritan to represent himself. But not one time was it done to the Gentile. For this is the day of the Gentile. It's the ending now. That's why he said, when the Holy Ghost has come and does the same thing. Now, if Jesus manifested himself to the Jew in that manner, and to the Samaritan in that manner, he's obligated to his word to manifest himself to the Gentile that way. For we all know we're at the end. Then what did happen? Ninety percent said he had an evil spirit doing that, or some kind of a makeup. And as it was then, so is it now. There was a thousand times more bleed John's message than it did his message, and counting the time. Now, what's the world waiting for today is to see the display of Jesus Christ. What is the true believer waiting for today? To see Jesus Christ. And the voice saying, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. What's the world dying for today? Not a new denomination. Not a new bishop over the church. Not a new mayor in the city. Not some new building or school of ethics. What's it waiting for? To see the display of the real love of the living God for dying humanity. What will happen to the unbeliever? Jesus said a little while, and the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, for I, personal pronoun, will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The display, something gallant, it strikes the man who's got any spirituality in him. Some time ago, reverence for a minute, please. You know I'm a hunter. I love the outdoors. That was my Bible. As I said this afternoon, my mother's a half Indian, which makes me love the outdoors. And I used to go to the North Woods a hunting. I had a friend up there named Bert Call. One of the best hunters I ever hunted with. Oh, a woodsman, you didn't have to worry about him being lost. He knowed his way around. A wonderful hunter, but the cruelest hearted man I ever seen. Oh, he was cruel in his heart. He loved to shoot little fawns just because he knows it, it got me for him to do it. And he would say to me, Oh, you preachers, you're too chicken hearted. I'd say, Bert, you are a wonderful boy, but how can you be so cruel? He said, get next to yourself, preacher. Now, it was all right for him to kill one fawn. The law permitted him to do that, but not just to kill him to be killing. I'm a hunter, but not a killer. So then when I watched that, and I'd have to turn my face. And one year when I went up there, Bert had invented himself a little whistle. And he could take that little whistle and cry just like a little baby fawn. I said, Bert, you're not going to use that. Oh, he said, Billy, get next to yourself. You preachers are just too chicken hearted. Now, he was doing it just to be mean. And we went hunting that day in his long noon time. We hadn't even seen a track. And he was walking ahead of me, a little larger man than I, a few years older, and he stooped down by a little opening. There's snow on the ground about like it is outside now. And he picks up this little whistle out of his pocket, and he stooped down, 
and he cried like a little fallen. And when he did, just across the clearing, hardly as far as this arena is across, a great big mother doe, that's the female deer, raised up. And he looked back to me with those sheepish looking eyes. And he laughed to himself. I knew what was coming. That mother raised her head. Oh, I could see her big brown eyes and those veins in her face, those big majestic ears sticking up. Oh, she was a beautiful sight. And she was looking. What was it? A baby was in trouble. And she, by nature, was a mother. She wouldn't have raised up any otherwise. But the baby was calling. Not only that, but she walked out in this clearing. Oh, never would she have done that in the daytime. She knew it was dangerous. The hunter would spot her. But what was it? A baby was crying. She was a mother. It was something in her. It was a put on as Christians try to do today. It was real. She was a mother. She walked out in the open. I heard the rifle come back with the projector and the boat slid down covering over a 30 aught 6 shell. I seen that hunter burnt, laid out. Oh, he was a dead shot. And the crosshairs in that scope laid across that mother doe's heart. I thought, oh my, in another second or two, he'll blow her heart from to her. I thought, Bert, how can you do that? That mother, she can't help it. She's a mother. Can't you see? She's got no fear. She's not putting on her act. There's something in her. She's a mother. She steps right out in the face of death. The baby's crying. Where's it at? And as I seen drew that bead, oh, I just turning my head, and the deer spotted the hunter. She jumped. Those big ears stuck out like cats. Right down to the brisket. I seen that rifle drop. Oh, I turned my head. I thought, I can't watch that. That display of something real. Something real, a genuine love. For she was a mother. It was real love. She never run. The baby was in trouble. Though it took her life, she would see the baby through. And I turned my head, and I began to pray silently, Oh, God, don't let him do that. How can he be so cruel-hearted? And I waited. The gun never fired. I waited a little longer. The gun never fired. And when I turned, the gun was going like this. He turned and looked at me. He threw the gun on the ground and grabbed me by the legs. He said, Billy, I've had enough of it. Pray for my sinful soul. There on that ground, in that snow, I led that cruel-hearted man to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's seen the display of something that was real. Way down in him, he had an outside that he was trying to make me feel bad. But inside down there, it was hungering for something real. And when he saw the display of real mother love, he surrendered himself to Christ. Friend tonight, and Christian tonight, and believer tonight, what the world's waiting for, not the whole world over, not everybody in the world, but the real believer is waiting to see God display himself in a genuine 
act of the Holy Spirit, it will cause man to be drawn to him. Let us bow our heads just a moment for prayer, if the sister will go there. Merciful God, who raised up the Lord Jesus on the third day, and he gave the commission. You said before that, this is my beloved Son, hear ye him. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. These signs will follow them that believe. The works that I do shall you also. I'll be with you to the end of the world, healing the sick, performing miracles, great signs and wonders in the display of his resurrection. May he demonstrate to us tonight as the mother dear, and may people tonight who are in here, may be covered up under some church cloak, may they see his presence May they understand by the Scripture that this is the day and the hour that he's manifesting himself to the Gentile race just before the judgment strikes. For he's a sovereign God who keeps his word. Open blinded eyes to see truth. And we pray that you'll speak to the heart of the sinner just now and give to them salvation instead of condemnation by the law and by justice. May they find that Jesus Christ met the justice of God and, met, and, and he required death and he died the innocent for the guilty that we could be free. May they come in simple believing as we wait. I wonder while you have your heads bowed, your eyes closed, is there a person, sinner, Outside of Christ, maybe you're a church member, that doesn't spell it. But you would like to have the real thing in you to display Jesus Christ to a dying world in the last days and you know you haven't got it. Maybe you say, oh, I'm a Christian, I belong to church. That doesn't do a thing. That only makes you worse. For oh, I'd rather be an infidel than a hypocrite. You say, I'm not a hypocrite. And if you go to church and pretend to be of Christ and do the things of the world, your own works tells what you are. You're ashamed of your testimony? Was that mother dear ashamed? No, there was something in her. She was a mother. She couldn't help it. Would you like that spirit in you? That would make you a real Christian. If you would, would you raise your hands while you have your heads bowed and say, Brother Branham, pray for me. God bless you, lady. God bless you, sir. God bless you back there, sir. God bless you over here, lady. Up at the balcony. God bless you. Somebody else. God bless you, lady. God bless you, sir. And you, lady. And you, and you back there. Another. Let the Holy Spirit now convict your heart friend god bless this young girl sitting here just raise your hands now it'll mean a lot to you just raise your hand maybe you're a church member i'm saying if you're not born again you're lost will you receive christ now as your savior say i want to have that kind of a spirit in me brother brandon that i can display christ's love although i've belonged to church a long time but i've never had that experience I want something in me that makes me genuine. Will you raise your hand, some of those who haven't? Just now while we're waiting? God bless you. Bless this little lad. Bless the lady here. Back in the back. That's good. All right. While dozens of hands have been up realizing that you're wrong, God is with you. Or you would never raise your hand. Now I wonder if you that raised your hand would just stand for a moment for a word of prayer. Let everybody keep their head bowed. Just stand up to your feet just a moment for a word of prayer. If you really meant it, raise up now your feet. That's right. That's right. Just getting up everywhere, all over the place. Stand up just a moment for a word of prayer. If you witness me before man, him will I witness before the Father. 
It's nothing to be ashamed of. If you're ashamed of me here, I'll be ashamed of you before the Father and the holy angels. And let me say this as his servant, Jesus Christ is here. If he don't manifest himself tonight in the same measure he did when he was here on earth, I'm a false prophet. And I'm found a false witness. But if he does, I've told the truth, and God wrote the right thing, and this is the word of God who declares it will be. Would there be another before we pray? Stand to your feet. I don't want you to join any church. You join the church you want to. I want you to accept Christ and be real in your heart. Real, let the Holy Spirit, while it's here, speak to you. If you're a member of a church, go back to your own church. That's all right. We just want you to be a Christian, really, in your heart. While you remain standing, let us pray. I just confess all your faults just now, for he knows your weakness. Lord God, as our mind goes back just now to that hour when that hunter was convinced that there was something real in the world, he had only seen the faults, he had only seen the put on, but he'd come in contact being a hunter with a wild animal, a creature of God who could displace something that was real. By the simple message of the gospel, these people tonight, before anything has been done, they are convinced by the presence of the Holy Spirit that they're wrong and they're standing to accept you. Now, I can only quote your word. You said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life and shall never come to the judgment but pass from death unto life. That's your own word, Lord. And again you said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. Then how present is God? People standing to their feet, convinced, some of them maybe staunch church members, but they're not ashamed to stand to their feet. Something has strangely warned their heart. It was God the Father fulfilling His Word. Jesus' Word being fulfilled, which said, No man can come except the Father draws him, and all the Father gives me, they're mine. No man can pluck them from my hand, and I'll raise them up at the last day. Here they are, Lord. The Word has been preached. The Holy Spirit has drawn. Men and women are on their feet as a testimony that they love you and believe you and want you to come in a deep, settled peace of their heart and make them gallant Christians. I present them to you now, Lord, as trophies of the grace of your Son, Jesus. And may you keep them and fill them with your Spirit and may their life bear fruits of a real Christian. And if displaying such, may they win others. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to those who are standing up, when they sit down, you who are next to them who are Christians, shake their hands and give them the right hand of fellowship. And the ministers might take them to their churches. Now you can be seated now, you who are standing. And God give unto you that what you have desired. Oh, I love him. Isn't he wonderful? I love to see that. Reach over and shake hands with them. That's right. If you're a real Christian, you want to do it. You want to show them, welcome to this great family. I see others getting up, reaching around, shaking hands. God bless you. That's right. That's right. You've done the right thing. Now, you must find yourself a good church, a place, a church of your choice, and there be a royal member of the family of Christ until death sets you free. That's right. It'll be a wonderful thing. God be with you and bless you. That's good. I like to see that. Even man going up and seeing others and shaking hands. What we need here in this city is an old-fashioned breaking up, tearing down, rebuilding. Oh, God grant it this coming week is my prayer. 
that churches and men and women can get their hearts together in this last great hour. God give me strength this week to bring the gospel messages as I believe he would have it done. Now, for the next few moments, if you'll just give me your undivided attention. It's my privilege to pray for sick people. And as I just mentioned in my sermon a few moments ago, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he is the same, he's obligated to act the same. If he's the same, he's the same in principle. He's the same in power. And how many people know that the Bible teaches that Jesus said himself, I do nothing till the Father shows me first. I mean, uh, then Jesus seen a vision before he done anything. There was a woman one time that he didn't see a vision of. She touched his garment. And Jesus didn't even know it was done. He said, who touched me? They all denied it. And Peter rebuked him, said that they're all touching. He said, but I perceive that I got weak. Virtue gone from me. Well, he looked around, and if he could discern their thoughts, he found the woman. And he told her her trouble had ceased, for her faith had made her whole. How many knows the Scripture says that? If he's the same yesterday and forever, he'll do the same. Is that right? Does the Bible say that he is a high priest now that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities? Does he, is that the Scripture? Certainly it is. So now in this building tonight is perhaps in this little group of people, just a handful of us, but I never, no matter if God sends me five, I preach just the same to five. I've had the privilege to preach to a half a million at one time. Seen 30,000 raw heathens come to Christ at one altar call. 30,000 heathens break their idols on the ground and accept Jesus as their Savior. One sign before any of those people will bring tens of thousands to Christ. America, they're so taught, so fed, so well cared for. I am rich. I have need of nothing. Knowest thou not that thou art naked, wretched, blind, and know it not? But if the Lord Jesus, how many knows that he has promised these things that he did, should the church also? How many believe that this is the end of the Gentile age and God is obligated to show himself in the same manner as he said he would do to both Jew and Samaritan? And he never went to any Gentile and forbid his disciples to go, I want to ask you something. Why didn't Jesus perform some miracles over in Samaria? He never performed one miracle. He taught them. Why? He knew Philip was coming down for that great revival. How many knows that? Philip went out to heal the sick and everything. Why didn't he go to the Gentiles and perform the miracle that he made the Jew and the Samaritan believe? He knew this day was coming. If anybody gets the wrong impression and think that I'm trying to say something about myself, you are wrong. I am your brother and nothing more, a sinner saved by grace. But through a divine gift that the Holy Spirit has given, he manifests himself. As you know, if you've heard me preaching, I'm not a preacher because I can't talk. I have no education. But my gift is a prophetic gift. And God promised it in the last days. And it's nothing but Jesus didn't have to heal, but he healed that it might be fulfilled. And these things are done not because God has to, but because that it might be fulfilled. Now, we call the people to the platform. I cannot heal anyone. No other man can heal. No medicine can heal. No doctor can heal. No hospital can heal. I want to talk to the doctor that can heal. I want to talk to any man that can heal. He's wrong. If I broke my arm and run into a doctor's office and said, heal my hand right quick, doc, I want to finish cranking my car. He'd say, you need mental healing. He can set the bone, but God has to heal, for God is the only creator. A doctor can move an obstruction, pendic or a, a tumor or something, but God has to heal. A doctor can pull a tooth. God has to stop the blood and develop cells. He's the only healer. You say, what about penicillin? For a bad cold. That's like 
rat poison in the house. You got a bunch of rats, you put out some rat poison. They're eating up the house, holes in the house. Now the rat poison doesn't patch the holes, it kills the rats. And that's what penicillin does, kills the flu germs, and God has to develop the cells and life back again. He's the only healer. He said, Psalms 103, 3, I'm the Lord who heals all your diseases. If there's any other healing, God told something wrong. If Satan can heal, God told something wrong. Jesus said Satan cannot heal. To be a healer, he'd have to be a creator. If he's a creator, he's God. Satan cannot create. He perverts what God has created. He is not a, he is not a, a creator. He's a perverter. Righteousness, what is sin? Righteousness perverted. Correctly. Now, let us be reverent for a few moments, and if you will only believe. Now, please, if you must go for the next 15 minutes, if you can't stay, we're, I don't say God will do this. I'm trusting he will do it. If he will do it and say to do the same things here that he did back there, how many will believe him? Raise your hand and say, I will accept it and believe it. All right, be real reverent now for a moment. Now, Heavenly Father, the rest is up to you, my dear God and Lord. And when we leave here tonight, these people going to their different homes, there was two disciples one time after the resurrection walked with you all the way to Emmaus. When you got them inside and the doors closed, you did something that no other man could do like that. And their eyes were open and they recognized you. There may be many fine ministers, many fine church members who you've walked with and talked to but never they have recognized your omnipresent, your manifestation of your word. Now, Lord, be it we're gathered in this building, let the Holy Spirit shroud them into a little inn and then open their eyes and do something here now tonight like you did before your death, burial, and resurrection that they might know assure that the Christian religion is the only true religion there is. Mohammed... Buddha, all the other false gods are false. But you are a real God, a living God, one who is raised from the dead and alive forevermore, keeping your promises in every generation. Grant it, Lord. Help your unprofitable servant. And may I be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Yield your church to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's stand a few to their feet. Let's start with, where did we run last night? One day, one day. What'd you get out? What'd you get out? One, one, one to a hundred. And F, let's get number one then. Number two, who has them? Number one, look at your card. Somebody might be next to you that can't get up. I see a man look like in a wheelchair, if I'm not mistaken, sitting out over there. Uh, wait, is that right? Who has prayer card one? Would you raise your hand? About, oh, I'm sorry. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let them stand first and come. All right. If you'll just make your way right down here, uh, Dr. Vale will show you into the line. And if, you, if somebody's got those cards and can't get up, just tell someone next to you. They'll pack you. And now, as, well, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's one missing. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Come now, quickly. We're a little pressed for time, but don't be nervous. See? Don't be nervous. You upset everything. Jesus never was in a hurry for anything. So let's just be calm for a few moments. It may mean the difference between life and death. All right, those prayer cards from 1 to 10, I believe I call, come forward. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now, I will ask you with all that is within me, if you'll be reverent just a few moments. Just be seated, be quiet, just for a few moments. This is a time that no matter what I would say, if God doesn't back this up, then I'm wrong. 
then his word's wrong. And wouldn't you like to know whether Christianity is real or not? What if it's just a declaration of words? The Mohammedan can say the same thing. What if you say, oh, brother, like Dr. Morris Reedhead, when he talked to that Mohammedan, he said, looky here. He said, Mr. Reedhead, he said, Mohammedan just as real to me as Christ is to you. He said, how, what could your resurrected Jesus, as you call him, do for me anymore? Now, you know who Reedhead was. He was the president of the Sudan missions, the largest in the world. And he said, what, this educated Mohammedan, said, what could your Jesus do for me any more than Muhammad could do? He said, well, Jesus is raised again. He said, has he? He said, prove it. You just know this country here. Wait till you get over on the foreign field. He said, prove it. He said, well, sure I can prove it. He said, he's in my heart. He said, Jesus lives in my heart. The Muhammad said, Muhammad's in my heart. Well, he said, we have happiness and joy because Jesus said, he said, Mr. Reedhead, Mohammedan religion can produce just as much psychology as Christianity can. There you are. He said, we Mohammedans, which is a, three times the size of Christianity, Catholics and all together, he said, we Mohammedans are waiting to see you teachers produce what Jesus said would take place, that he's raised from the dead. When we see you do the things that he said that you would do, as he did, then we'll believe it. Until that, he's just as dead as Muhammad. Mr. Reedhead kicked the dirt and changed the subject. Sure. What else could he do? But when standing in Bombay with the Bible in one hand and the Koran in the other and a half a million of them before us, I said, I challenge any Muhammad to come and disprove this Bible. One of them's right and one's wrong. Mohammed's dead and Jesus is alive. And when Jesus proved himself by giving a total blind man, when they seen those things taking place, I never know what's coming in the prayer line. When they seen those things taking place, the ray jaws and all of them sitting out there thought it was a telepathy. I knew by the Holy Spirit that's what they were saying. I asked them, why do you say that? Why do you think that? But after a while, a blind man come by, told him who he was. I couldn't even pronounce his name, had to spell it to him. That's right. I said, you're a beggar. You're a married man with two children. Right. I said, you, you're a worshiper of the sun. You've been blind 20 years. Right. They still said telepathy. But then I looked back. I seen something blue and I looked. The man had his sight for the vision. Then all devils in hell couldn't stop it. No more than the resurrection of that little boy in Norway, laying on the road dead. That was told two years before it would happen. Certainly. Tens of thousands of things. Why don't it get out? Why don't it? Just like it's been in all ages. It's not far to get out. He's calling the honest and hard. We'll talk more of it next week. Notice now. But when the vision come and I said that God of the creation, I was in this Jan temple today, and you told me that your religion was greater than any religion, then let the God who made the man give him his sight. How many here, I said, will accept it if the God creator that'll give the man his sight? I wouldn't have said that if a vision hadn't come. But I had known where I was standing. God's word was spoke. It's true. There standing there in that total blind man. I said, will you serve the God that will serve you? Well, he, he said, yes. I said, what could you Mohammeds do for him now? Nothing. You could change his way of thinking. The Jans, the Buddha, and so forth, the same way. It's nothing but mass psychology. I said, we got the same thing in America. All the Methodists wants to make all the Baptists Methodists, and vice versa, and the Pentecostals wants them all to be Pentecostal. We got one God, but it's just mass psychology. That's the God that speaks be God. That's right. And they all agreed that they would receive him. I took the man to my arm and prayed a little simple prayer for him, and God restored his sight. And the mayor of the city of Bombay was sitting there, the man grabbed him, and thousands and thousands received Christ at one time. What's the matter? We failed to do what Jesus said. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We built churches, denominations, and schools. That's all right, but that's not what he said. He said, preach the gospel. 
The gospel is the power and demonstration of the resurrected Jesus. Paul said so. And that makes it. The Lord grant. Now, please, don't move around. Sit real quiet. How many out there doesn't have a prayer card? You won't be called in the line, but you believe Christ will heal you. Raise your hand. So I can just get a... Con- oh, it's just all- everywhere. All right? You just believe. You just look towards heaven and say, Lord, I believe it with all my heart. And if we are the, vi- the branch, he's the vine, he energizes the vine and will speak just like he did, or he isn't the same. Now, here's a woman standing here. We don't know each other as far as I know. How many in here that doesn't know me out there? Let's see your hands. Don't I know nothing of you? You in the prayer line, if you're a stranger, to me, raise your hand. In the prayer line here, raise up your hand. You're a stranger. We've never met before. Here's our hands. Here's the Bible. We've never met before in our lives. If this woman's sick and wants healing, I couldn't heal her. The only thing, if Jesus is standing here, he could not heal her. How many know that? Certainly not. He's already done it. When he died, he did it. Now to you new babies in Christ who accept Christ a while ago, see if your God is real, for his spirit is here now. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I take every spirit in here under the jurisdiction of the Holy Spirit, which is now anointing. I be reverent. One word might mean something. Now you're aware that something's going on. Standing before me as a man wouldn't make you feel that way, because I'm just your brother. But there's something happening to you. In another dimension, I see. If the Lord Jesus will tell me what your trouble is, as he did the woman at the well, you know whether it's the truth or not. And if it is the truth, would you believe it's him that's doing it? May he grant it. My sincere prayer. You're suffering with an extremely nervous condition. That's right. That's right. Raise your hand. She could have had something else, but it's that nervous condition. That's right. Do you believe? Now watch. Now while the anointing is here, and stop thinking that, a stage show back there, God will put the disease up on you, it comes from her. I'm not reading her mind. Yes, I see you. Real extremely nervous. And you got a headache kind of. It's a sinus condition. You got trouble in your side. You've had a appendicitis operation. You've got skin cancer, too. You believe that is the Spirit of God here? Then there's something got me anointed. You know I don't know those things, and I don't know what I told you. Only by the tape. You heard a voice speaking to you. It wasn't mine. It was something else, because I wouldn't know what to say. You believe it's his fulfilling his word? Then come here just a minute. Jesus said these th- words. These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. You believe that? Let the church bow their heads. Eternal and blessed Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, may everything that this woman has desired come to her now, for I ask it in his name. Amen. God bless you, lady. Go on your road rejoicing, being happy. We are strangers to each other. I never have seen you in my life. Now, be reverent. Don't move around. Pray. Something happened, man. I didn't catch it. See what it is? How many ever seen the picture of it back there? A light. How many knows that God is that light? How many knows the pillar of fire that led the children through the wilderness was Jesus Christ? How many know that's true? Sure it is. Then when he was here on earth, he said, I come from God, I go to God. How many knows that's the truth? All right. When he went back to God, what did he go back to after his resurrection? Paul met him on the road to Damascus. He was a light. Is that right? Peter is a prison. Right. Here he is today, the same yesterday, day, and forever. There's his picture back there. 
call Washington, D.C. in the Religious Hall of Art and find out the supernatural being photographed and by George J. Lacey, the head of the FBI. See if it's right or not. In Germany, in Switzerland, and everywhere, the same Jesus. Certainly. Be reverent. All right, lady. If the Lord Jesus will reveal to me what you're here for, will you believe it and accept it? I want you, each one, to watch the expression on the people's face as they walk up. Oh, this glorious... I, I've never seen the woman, but I want to ask you, isn't there a kind of a sweet, humble feeling? It's that Holy Spirit. You say, I don't see it. I do. Paul saw the light, but no one with him saw it. It's here. Now, see if the fruits bear record of it. If it's Jesus, he'll do the same that he did. You're nervous, too. Very nervous. And you have something that you've been tested with, something over your arm. It's high blood pressure. That's correct. You got trouble with your leg. That's right. Now, if you might know that I, as the Holy Spirit here who knows your life, you've got a bad back, and that was caused by an automobile accident. That's thus saith the Lord. Now, do you believe you are healed? Go on your royal rejoicing. You don't need prayer. Your faith has made you whole. Here it is. It's a woman out there on the end. You had high blood pressure, too. The lady in the blue coat. That's right. And listen, you had heart trouble also, didn't you? That's right. Raise up your hand. Stand up on your feet. You touched Jesus Christ and he's healed you. Amen. Oh, to the blessed Holy Spirit, can you realize that the God that will judge you in the day of judgment is in you here in the presence of us now, or we're in his presence? Oh, the great rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the morning star. Can't you see that the Spirit is bearing record of the same thing the Bible said? How can we set callous? I've wondered sometimes who people who claim to have kissed the rim of the blessings of God can't bear a few minutes. I suppose, lady, that we are strangers to each other. If the Holy Spirit will reveal to me what you're here for, will you believe it with all your heart? It's the light. I have to watch it as it goes. The people, the people out there are, have faith and they're just beginning to believe. You see, that's what makes it. I can only speak as it goes. Yes, you are suffering with the trouble, the rectal trouble, the falling condition. That is right. Not only that, but there's a woman appears here. You're praying for her. It's two of them. They're your sisters. That's right. You're not from this city or this state. Looks to me like it's Minnesota. And where you're from is a great big building. It's got a lake by the side of it, a great big, fa great famous... It's Rochester. There's the Mayo Clinic. That is correct. Go home and find it the way you have believed, and it'll be just that way, in Jesus' name. How do you do? Here's the picture again. A colored woman, a white man. Here is a real picture of the Samaritan case. A man and a woman, two different, uh, two different races, a colored woman, a white man. Lady, i never seen you in my life, as I know of. God knows that whether it's true or not. If I don't know you and you don't know me, raise your hand. Now, I want to ask you something. This woman and I, before God, we've never met before. 
and here we stand, a perfect picture of the Bible. Now, if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he will manifest himself to you Gentiles like he did to the Samaritans, how many Gentiles will believe it with all their heart? Let's see your hands. It'll settle it if he'll do it for this woman. These visions make weakness. You can see that. I want to talk to you just a moment, ladies. You be the judge. If I told you you were sick and going to get well, you'd only have my word for it. But if God revealed something that's back in your life like he did to the woman at the well, you know whether that's the truth or not. You know where that happened. I see the lady. She's suffering with arthritis. And she's got stomach trouble. And I see her going into a hospital, coming out of a hospital, go back into the hospital and come out three times. You've been in a hospital. That's thus saith the Spirit. You have been healed before by divine healing. You had a tumor once, and blindness in your eyes, and you was healed. You believe that the Spirit of the living God is here? Yes. Oh, no. You are a believer. You've already healed my eyes. <laughs> yes. Certainly you're healed. <laughs> that you might know yes. that the Spirit of Christ is here. If I've never seen you, i tell you who you are. Would you believe then that the Lord Jesus, who knows who Simon Peter was, could know is the same Christ? How many would believe with all their heart? A colored woman I've never seen in my life. My hands to God. You be the judge. Your name is Hattie Green. That's Purdue. And you live at 217 Chella Street. That's exactly right. And you were sitting in the building today while I were preaching and seen the angel of the Lord yes, present? That's exactly right. Amen. That's thus saith the Lord. Go home. You're well, lady. Yes. Jesus Christ makes you yes. well. Amen. Do you believe with all your heart? Yes. Why not receive him then? If you believe it, your heart's right us to be gone. Will you believe it? All right, go rejoicing. Amen. What about you in the audience? Will you believe it? Will you have faith in God? What's to hinder you from having faith in God? Here, the lady sitting right here, a dark, evil spirit hanging over the young lady. Sit quiet, everybody. There's a dark spirit hanging right here before me. It's an epileptic. It belongs to that all oh, right on that girl sitting right there. Do you believe, young lady, that the God will make her well? Lay your hand over on her. Satan, leave the girl. You're exposed. You're an evil. Come out of her in the name of Jesus Christ. You were so kind behind her to lay your hands on her. You were suffering with a nervous condition. God heals you at the same time. Amen. You with your hand up just uh, on the side that you just put it down. You've got a throat condition that you want God to heal you of. Lady in the blue dress. You believe it? God will make you well then. Raise your hands and accept it and believe it with all your heart. How do you believe? The lady sitting right here with the green sweater on with the chest trouble. Do you believe that God will make you well, lady? All right, raise your hands and accept it. Praise the Lord. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. You have to believe. Arthritis, do you think that God would heal you? If you can believe it with all your heart, you can have what you ask for. Amen. Don't sit there like that. Accept it. It goes over you, sure, lady. Now raise up to your feet. Red, red hat on. Yes, raise up to your feet right quick. 
Lift up your feet now. Go home and be well. Jesus Christ heals you. Amen. Respond when the Holy Spirit's speaking. Real quickly. Let God know that you believe him. The lady right behind praying there. You got colon trouble. Do you believe that God will heal you, lady? Jump to your feet real quick and accept it. I challenge you in Christ's name right now to accept it and see what God will do. How many believe that God will heal you right now? Raise up your hands. Stand to your feet in the name of Jesus Christ and don't doubt. Raise your hands up to God and give him praise and you shall have what you've asked for. Almighty God, oh Lord, in this great city here where so much unbelief and doubt is circling, the day of judgment will soon arrive. Oh, I challenge this devil that it'll leave this building tonight and come out of these people, every one of them, in the name of Jesus Christ. Raise your hands out and give him praise. Go home and be well.